Welcome to Lectionary Call-In for Tuesday, July 4th of 2023, where laypersons and pastors gather for about 45 minutes each week to discuss the Gospel Lectionary for the coming Sunday. And the Sunday text we're discussing is for July 9th of 2023. Each Tuesday, we call in from wherever we may be at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time to, to participate, and our team is working to be faithful to year A, and that puts us in the Gospel of Matthew. We hope this discussion will provide areas of focus and reflection. Here's how it works. We develop perspectives independently after the lead-off person shares some formative questions. And then in this virtual discussion, we share and encourage and challenge each other. And here are the folks joining us in today's discussion. Sarah Mickelson in Tampa. Bill Hall, St. Petersburg, Florida. I'm Don Upton. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and our lead for today is Bill Hull, and he's going to read the scripture for us and walk us through some formative questions. Hello, Bill. Hope you're doing well today. Happy Fourth of July. Thank you. Happy Fourth to you, my colleagues, and those listening and viewing. Great way to start an early Tuesday morning. Coffee, colleagues, and a uh, challenging passage. I want to make a few brief comments, and then I will read the scripture from Matthew 11. We're in year A, so we're primarily focusing in gospel readings from Matthew. Um, The Presbyterian planning calendar lists only a portion of this passage. They leave out verses 20 to 24. But in a moment, I'm going to include them for several reasons. Uh, First of all, they are included in Scripture. Um, Matthew chose to include this. And I'm troubled, and others are, by the revised common lectionaries consistently avoiding the tough passages in the Bible. When you hear it, you will understand that it is tough. Even Walter Brueggemann a leading light in biblical interpretation has expressed concern about this pattern in the lectionary. Uh, One of our resources texts, we lists it both ways, and I have chosen to include the full passage. Um, Because years ago, one of the most memorable communion services at Presbytery meeting, the host pastor said, you will note, that the crust is on the bread, the homemade bread here. My folk who prepare communion always want to cut the crust off, and I've told them today they're not, because we need sometimes to chew on and wrestle with some of the difficult parts of Scripture and the life of faith. So uh, we've got a lot to ingest here today and more than we can fully do. And finally, For the sake of the flow in Matthew chapter 11, I will read the lead in verse 15, and the passage is Matthew 11, 16 to 30. I begin with verse 15. Let anyone with ears listen. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another, saying, we play the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came, John the Baptist, came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Then he, Jesus, began to reproach the cities in which most of his deeds of power had been done because they did not repent. He said, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? 
No, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Now, I've noted for my colleagues in our pre-recording conversations that these questions that I'm about to share grow out of my own struggle. And I say that because I've mentioned before that the questions that we have and the puzzlements that we have, I think, can be a rich resource as we preach and lead Sunday school classes and discussions and as we engage in our own journey. So to give you a flyover, I will read the three questions and then come back and start. In verses 16 to 17 and 25, Jesus refers to children and infants. For you, how do these references inform your understanding of Jesus' message for us today as his followers. Question two. This passage presents a bewildering and even mystifying mixture of tones and images, some of which are anger, judgment, joy, burden. What other tones and images do you perceive, and how does this constellation of human Emotions and experiences impact you. And question three. In verses 29 to 30, Jesus calls us to take his yoke upon us. And so doing, Jesus says, we will learn from him. How have you seen that working out in your life? Okay. Back to one. And Sarah, I'm going to come to you first in a moment. In verses 16 to 17 and 25, Jesus refers to children and infants. For you, Sarah, how do these references inform your understanding of Jesus' message for us today as his followers? Sarah? seems to suggest to me that at this time, those who see the truth of Jesus' mission and see it plainly are often the ones not recognized by the, the temple leadership for wisdom and for um, acceptability to, um, into the structure of the temple. Um, so like children in Jesus' time who are often considered not good earners yet, um, not valid participants, and more of a burden. Um, they are discarded or um, overlooked as sources of of wisdom. So I think it's sometimes we're asked to consider the cultural values in which we work and live, and 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 what they present as desirable. And that might stand in contrast to what Christ followers are asked to pursue and treasure. And and I think we see that in the scripture, that there's this strong contrast between what the temple leadership sees as valuable and what Jesus sees as valuable. And I think it's also um, 
a strong contrast between what they see as acceptable and what Jesus sees as acceptable. And um, so for me, that's how I see the use of infants or children in this particular passage. Thank you. Well said. Don, for you, the reference to children and infants, how does it inform your understanding for the gospel today? And your your question, the way it's framed, helps too, because I think this is one of those lectionary passages that can be daunting just because it's so complicated and there's so many things. Mm-hmm. So your question, for those that are listening that are planning to moderate meetings, great starting point for me because it gave me something to hold on to. And, you know, if you think, of, if you think back to when you first encountered complicated poetry or prose, it, it could be overwhelming. Uh, and, you know, and I can remember teachers saying, well, why don't you just grab something? <laughs> you know, here you're saying, children, go there, Don, right? But start somewhere. <laughs> start with a metaphor. Find something. Find some action and then build that out. So I appreciate you picking children. As for you adding additional text to the lectionary, how dare you? This is hard enough. How dare you? But I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is hard enough. Uh, so I've got uh, holding on to the idea of the children. It, it helped me think about who's vulnerable or who are, actually has insights. And it came down to me, it's, he's talking about who's encountered the Christ already and what do you do. You've encountered the Christ, what are you doing? And in this case, you, they're acting like children. And I know in other parts of the gospel, children are used differently than this. So I'm looking at the opening passage about children. This is not about the meek and mild. This is the, this, the first, the entry point on children is not about the vulnerable. It's about recklessness. This is my interpretation. Recklessness, having seen the Christ, what do you do? You act like children playing. And um, I, a refusal to engage, a refusal to take it seriously, or a refusal to do anything more than play dress up with it. And I think there's the concept of, like, dress up, and it's not serious. It's like playtime. So you encounter the Christ, you witness what's going on, and then it's like you're doing playtime. So I, this was crystallized by a very short piece written by Stanley Saunders in July, uh, July 6th, posted July 6th of 14th, where he's focusing on the failure of a witness to respond which I think is pretty well put. And I'm going to quote him just, just a few lines and let this lie. Quote, one group of children wants to play wedding but can't get the others to dance. When the tune is piped, the other group wants to play funeral but can't get the others to mourn with them. I'll skip a few lines. The children all just sit hurling bitter invectives against each other, against one another. End quote. So, yeah, just I'm holding on to the children idea. Thank you, Bill. And this is a playing out not only of a lack of seriousness, having engaged, having encountered the work of the Christ, what do you do? And this is business as usual, life, silliness, uh, trivialization, dress up. And I think the poetry of this is what what what's being picked isn't just playing games, they play two specific games, two of the most serious things in the business of life, the newness and the promise of a wedding, ha-ha, and the mourning of the loss of the beloved, ha-ha. So I, I just thought uh, Saunders crystallized that, for me, so beautifully, and I'll just stop right there. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, um... Sarah, I resonate with your emphasis that children represent the unexpected. And, Don, your begin somewhere. You reminded me of whatever grade it was that we first dealt with poetry. I and all my fellow students were bewildered, and the teacher did a good thing. Tell me one thing you do understand from the poetry. As you say, begin there. And, again, I will acknowledge this is a... Uh, bewildering passage. Um, 
the emphasis on children, I, I will affirm primarily for me, Sarah, it means the same thing. It's the the last shall be first. The, it's the who's soon to be least is greatest in the field. Jesus even upped the ante about children when he said, unless you become like a child, <laughs> you will not enter the kingdom. There's an image that scholars have dealt with. I think it's helpful that scripture doesn't tell us exactly what Jesus means by become like a child. You know, trusting, adventuresome, uh, curious, uh, all of the above and and more. Um, Needing to be cared for, but also needing to act on one's own. So that's that's a powerful image. And my, my part of my question was, how does this impact your understanding of the message for today? And I will say, we're here to uh, celebrate all worship communities. One of the many things my wife and I appreciate about Palmasia Christian Church is the presence and high valuing of children and youth. <clears throat> along with the other ministries engaged in by this worship family. Jesus makes it clear and compelling in this week's gospel narrative and in many other places that children have much to teach us about God and our role in God's kingdom. I think we've only just begun to glean what God is teaching us uh, through children. Second question, and Don, I'm going to come to you first in a moment to repeat myself a bit. This passage presents a bewildering and even mystifying mixture of tones and images, some of which I discern anger, judgment, joy, burden. What other tones and images do you perceive and how does this constellation of human emotions and experiences impact you, Don? We could go on and on on this one. It's such a massive, massive piece. So I'm just going to pick just a few ideas and let it lie. Uh, I I work in a space professionally that deals with or ministers to assumptive behaviors, often of leaders, that we do things a certain way because we do things a certain way because it's been done in the past or I trust in the systems with which I inherit. And I think that's part of this here. It's like it's one of the blockbuster things that are here because we start with, and I know I'm using children in different ways than you two were, but, you know, it starts with children in terms of recklessness and silliness and triviality. And, uh, and why is that? If, if we start with, you've encountered the, the, the ministry of Christ, you've encountered the Christ, and therefore what do you do? I think it's, it's, a, it's a nod towards the power of the assumptive behavior of everybody. I know I have it in my heart. Even if I have I think about the bright and shiny and wonderful things that I encounter every week, uh, yet I go on. I don't change. And, it, and not only is it talk about that, that power of going on with your assumptions, but the power of human beings to trivialize, even in the face of the ministry of Christ. So, you know, you, you go on to the cross and the gospel, how the gospels deal with the, the final hours of Christ and, and how, how Christ is mocked. And mockery is echoing in this to me uh, with the front end of the children. Uh, we mock the funeral. We mock mourning and loss. We mock the wedding and the future and, and, and your beloved. And, I mean, all of that is just held up as the starting point for this. So I'll, ju- I'll, I'll just say I, I think what, what's coming out of this is, the power of the assumptions that we make in our lives and our power to mock. And, and in the past, we talked about uh, Christ riding to the gate and folks laying down their cloaks as he's riding into the city. And this is my personal position. Uh, 
that I think it's important to read that as a dress-up story. I think it's more powerful if the people that are laying down their garments and celebrating Christ, that that's just a tradition. That, that of course, we celebrate kings. And there's going to be another person to ride through that gate in about an hour, and they're going to celebrate that person because they're playing dress-up. That even those that have touched and seen the Christ can still engage in superficial mockery. And it's a, it's, it is a powerful start to, to this. So I'm kind of continuing the idea of the children and dress up to say this is, this is dark, but also confrontational in a way that I think tells me, and by the way, we're, you know, we're meeting at 6.30 a.m. The sun hasn't come up yet. You know, when the sun comes up, what am I going to be focused on? You know, because I have the power to trivialize anything I want to. Uh, it's a real challenge. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Don. Sarah, your reflections. Don, I'm right there with you. I, I think that this is exactly that. Um, and, you know, in contrast, for me, I hear in this passage, we're talking about the tones and images and constellation of human emotions, I hear discouragement. I hear heartbreak. I hear rejection. I hear, you know, that sense of of loss because you've played, you've laid your heart out on the table and they have looked at it and went, no, thank you. I would rather have Brussels sprouts. And it's like, what? I don't understand. This is so valuable. This is important. And and to have somebody trivialize it and minimize it. I think that's the other thing is, is treating it like it's a, 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 a performance rather than a life. And I think that's, I think, right in the middle of this. Um, and I think I hear in this conversation when Jesus lists out the communities where he's done the most work and, and, and talks about other communities that were completely decimated. Um, he lifts up what he'd hoped for and, and, and how much that he offered, what this, what this would have meant um, if, if the kingdom of God had been brought near and they had, they had um, fully embraced this opportunity instead of looking at it going, no, thank you, it's sloppy Joe night down the street, we're going there. You know, that, that sense of um, uh, just tossed away. And for me, I, I hear, and more than anything, the discouraging heartbreak rejection um, in, the, in the way that he speaks about or the, the scripture lifts up um, their, their disregard of something, something treasurable, something valuable. It's almost like he offers them um, untold wealth, and they go, no, thank you. We're going to go pick up coins. You know, it's kind of like, I, I don't know how else to describe it, except, you know, the woman at the well goes, give me the water that, that will sustain me forever so I won't have to come to this well all the time. It's that contrast to that story a little bit, too, um, for me. And I, I'm right there with you. And I think you're spot on with the dress up and the calling names and the the, the exchange between um, the children. It almost feels like that's the way he sees the Sanhedrin and, you know, that kind of perspective about the temple structures in Jerusalem. Thank you, Sarah. This question is what led me to look and notice verse 15, which I read as a lead-in. The New Revised Standard Version renders it as, let anyone with ears listen. There are some alternative texts that say, let anyone with ears to hear listen. In other words, if you're ready to listen and learn, then this is what follows. So, that's a signal to me from Jesus and Matthew and the compilers of this narrative. It's like, listen, sit up straight. Uh, there's something important to follow. And what follows is what I would describe as a kaleidoscope of human experiences. 
uh, joy and sorrow, discomfort and relief, conflicted and comforted, we could uh, appropriately uh, keep adding a list of the uh, mixture of experiences. And Jesus, the the chapter begins by uh, John wanting to know, is Jesus really, John Baptist in prison, is Jesus really the one? And we remember Jesus' response go and tell John what you see, what you hear. The lame walk, the blind have sight restored, etc. So John the Baptist can be seen primarily emphasizing God's judgment and Jesus as more representing God's grace. I think that's a little misleading. Because in judgment, there is grace, repent, and in grace, there is judgment. Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us there is no cheap grace. God's unmerited, unconditional forgiveness does not mean that anything goes, that I can do whatever I want, treat you any way I want to, because God's going to forgive me. Um, and to the difficult portion of the judgment of the cities, and it, it, it's harsh. I, I understand wanting to leave out those few verses, but here's what occurs to me. As followers of Jesus Christ, I'm more and more convinced, not wanting to descend into self-righteousness, there are things that should Invoke our anger and condemnation Slavery, segregation, apartheid Human trafficking, domestic violence Jesus in the temple Drove out the people who were profiting From those who needed within their culture To present sacrifices Uh, Jesus was capable of anger and a vigorous response. Now, again, there are risks in that, self-righteousness, crusades, um, wanting dominance over um, people's individual lives. There are risks. But I have some sense, I see through a glass darkly, some appreciation for Jesus' harshness. There are realities that simply go against um, what God wants this world to be about. Okay, the third question. In verses 29 to 30, Jesus calls us to take his yoke upon us. In so doing, Jesus says we will learn from him. How have you seen that working out in your life? Now, as the spouse of a gifted musician, um, I have a great appreciation for what how music reflects the human experience. And I can't do it, but I wonder what a composer would do with this passage. <laughs> how would you musically represent the frustration and the harshness and then in with, let me read it for us again. Let me get to it. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Here's the part that really confounds me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to say, Jesus, really? It's easy and light? How so? I'm not sure what that means. Um, Because yoke, in my emotional Vocabulary is usually not something pleasant. It's a, 
uh, the yoke of oppressors, the yoke of slavery. It has to do with limiting freedom or someone being forced to work for the betterment of another at the cost of one's dignity. Now, clearly, that is not what Jesus had in mind. So it it has occurred to me, because I've wrestled with this, that a modern equivalent could be that the yoke Jesus offers is to use our modern terminology, boundaries and agencies. Sarah, another one of Bill's both ends. (laughs) Boundaries. It is not true that Jesus Christ says anything goes. There are defined edges. Now, we can debate what they are. For example, in marriage, fidelity. In conflict, no violence. In betrayal, forgiveness. There are boundaries set by Jesus Christ. And also, to use the modern term, we have agency. God's gift of grace and forgiveness invites us to choose in turn to be caring and forgiving in the face of injustices. We are to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God, Micah 6, 8, bannered very appropriately and powerfully at Palmasia. We are to work for the greater good, but we are to do so in another juxtaposing of human emotions. We are to act in the face of injustices with compassion and kindness and engage in this work with humility. Easier said than done. Sarah, your thoughts on the yoke and how it works out in your life. It seems like in Jesus' time that the yoke is a sharp contrast. The yoke he offers is being held as a sharp contrast to the unbearable burden of cleanliness and holiness that the temple structures are forcing people to um, navigate through to have access to God. And, And I think Jesus is implying that the dress up required by the the, stru- the structure of the temple and the rules of the temple and the approach of the temple and the the location of the temple those things are all in direct contrast to how he sees the approach to God um and Jesus suggests that all that's required to follow him is by is to follow him and by doing so that we are walking in relationship with God already. I think that's a a huge shift in what's required of a believer at the time. And I think Jesus is also implying that artificial piety can be replaced by genuine need and authentic worship. Um, and, And that all... Although we are yielding our self-will to follow God's will, which I think is a a yoke of sorts, um, the benefits of doing so will put us in concert with God and in relationship with God. And in doing so, we will feel less um, out of step with our own selves if that makes sense, I'm not sure. Um, But it it would seem to me that you live in in tune with God versus out of step with God. So I I don't know how to articulate that. But I think think that even takes that making up or that um, dress up and pretend play thing that the kids are doing at the beginning of the scripture – um, that looks from the outside what the temple structure is doing and Jesus is inviting us into authentic living that's very helpful Sarah I in fact typed some notes that contrasting the yoke of the temple establishment with the yoke of Christ a, a new thought for me thank you Don your reflections the, this wouldn't work 
for me so well, if not for everything, leads up to it. So we have the stark contrast, starting with the children, the cynicism, the play, the acting, the dress up, the power of us to, to just wipe out. And then, Sarah, you said something in the, your response to the second question. You used the word decimated. So you go from the children to just decimation. And it's shocking. But at the same time, isn't it shocking how easily, I'll turn to myself, I have the power to dismiss beautiful things, to dismiss love, to dismiss what these children are really mocking, the love of people, the loss, the hope, marriage. I mean, you know, it, so it sets this up to, therefore, you know, what does the two sides of this look like? So I'm going to hold that yoke is a neutral term. Instead of that, you know, you can use that, you can turn it into good or bad, but I'm going to say neutral. And, and two ideas that I would offer. One is um, the work, the labor, the business of life. All right, so you've got the stark contrast, Sarah used the word decimation, the mockery, the trivialization, the cynicism. Is that living? The crisis, like you've you can you've actually seen what I do. <laughs> you've seen the work of Christ, and and you do this. That's how powerful we are. So consider this. Consider a new calling, a new profession, and yoke will come into this. So the analogy I would give today is, and I'm holding this up because this is something I get to work with every day. Is you know people say, well, I want to work with somebody that has an applied experience. I want somebody that has experiential experience. I want some people to be trained with hands-on. I want to have workplace learning. Uh, and I think that's an analogy to the work and the labor and the competencies and the skills and the discipline that Christ is bringing into this towards the end. You know, I like – we can debate whether the lectionary team should have cut the heart out of this, which now, Bill, you've made your point, and I'm with you. It should have been in there. But at the end, you're back to the yoke, which is, therefore, what's your profession? What's your calling? Uh, you know, possibly would say the bond servant of Christ. You're, you're in. You've got work to do. And it looks a lot happier and brighter than being, you know, so what's the yoke? So let's say, learn with me. Do. Serve. See. Don't play dress up. This is a happier world. This is a, this is a world that you can delight in. I don't know about you. I've had moments in my career where I could wake up every morning and get, say, I actually am so delighted to get to do what I do. And I think that's what Christ is now kind of like pulling the, all right, we're going to do dress up, pull the curtain back on this, real life, the business of life. And so what does the yoke have to do with that? I think that a yoke at the time is not meant to be onerous, but a good yoke is purposed engineered. And so it's a feat of engineering. It, if it's well engineered, it, it is to do with the health and the endurance of the, 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 the beast that is yoked. But also, it's, the purpose is for the work to be done effectively. So there's an engineering here that may be hard to, to look at today, but a well engineered yoke is light. It's light. It makes the labor possible. It allows the field to be plowed or, or goods to be transported. So I'm not saying we're compared to the beast that pulls, does it, but we're, I think, asked to think about what is it to participate in the business of life, the real business, the serious business of life, love, marriage, funerals. You know, what does it really mean having seen the Christ? And I think it's more about participatory work, the tactile work, seeing the return, seeing the outcomes of what we're doing. And, you know, am I being cynical and do I mock things because I think life's hard, that I don't want to be serious about it? My critic Christ is going, by the way, you know, you may want to mock it and be cynical about what it is to see the Christ, but it's good work. And the yoke is life. It is well engineered for your participation. So I, and good labor, competency, skills. Learn with me. There's the learning. It helps you learn. You can learn how to do this. Better and better. And, of course, the letters that follow Matthew are all about how do we learn. Oh, made a mistake here. Make a right turn. You can do it better. You can do it in a more excellent way. And I think the yoke is connected to the excellent, the excellent way. You need a good yoke. Well, I'm not exhausted at the end of the day. I have a good yoke, not a bad yoke. 
so I think the metaphor is pretty pure, or at least neutral there. So uh, I see we are almost out of time, but before we go, we bit off a lot here with some really great questions, Bill. Let's just see if there's anything else anybody wants to close with before we say goodbye. I'm going to add that a yoke is traditionally pulled by two animals. Um, the Oxford Dictionary defines it as a wooden cross piece that is fastened over the necks of two animals. And I think the impression here is Jesus is the pair, the other half of the pair. So when we're pulling in a yoke with Jesus, it's a lighter burden than when we try to do it alone. And, and I think that's the better interesting perspective. I would simply add thank you, colleagues. Thank you. And, and for those listening in, thank you for being a part of this conversation. And uh, it, I don't think there's been a week without comment, at least in my life. Folks want to dive in and uh, and talk about this. And and I'll say not not just necessarily with affirmation. Like, hmm, I think there's a more excellent way to talk about that. <laughs> I got challenged a couple <laughs> times this past week. It was it was a lot of fun and then a great deal for me. So we thank you for your uh, your input. Uh, Palmasia Presbyterian Church makes this podcast possible. They're at 3501 West San Jose. That's in Tampa, Florida. For more information, you can go to palmasia.org. That's P-A-L-M-C-E-I-E.org. Check that out. We always recommend that to you for great sermons, discussions of other lectionary passages, disagreements, prayers, outstanding music, opportunity to take communion. So check that out. And you are always welcome, and we'll see you next time.